Um, but I introduce our first speaker tonight, it's Paul Copshop. Paul um, was an economic policy advisor to the Chavez uh, government in Venezuela and um, actually was invited over to speak on a couple of occasions um, at one of the military colleges. His uh, book, um, which is uh, in English, is called uh, Towards uh, New Socialism. Well, I'll tell you what the Spanish name of it is because it was translated into Spanish. Um, but anyway, Paul's going to speak for approximately 10 minutes and then Tommy will speak and then we'll have time for questions and hopefully some answers to that. Paul. Okay. Um, I'm going to speak mainly about the present situation. Towards the end of my 10 minutes, which Tommy has allotted me, I will hark back to some things that struck me very forcibly when I visited Venezuela twice. The situation in the world at the moment is characterized by the United States repudiating a whole series of international treaties. The, the first one, obviously, was the Paris Climate Change Treaty. They then went and repudiated the treaty that had been negotiated between Iran, Europe, Russia, United States. They repudiated that unilaterally. Just last week, the United States repudiated the Intermediate Range Nuclear Weapons Treaty. And now they are in effect repudiating the United Nations Charter by attempting to dictate the government of another independent country. Article 2.7 of the UN Charter <coughs> states that nothing contained in the present Charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state and shall require or shall require the members to submit such matters to settlement under the present charter. And if we note, last week, the United States attempted to get the UN to intervene in Venezuela and say that the head of the, or the speaker of the assembly was now the president. The UN turned that down. Let's take a second example of breaking international conventions. In this case, the British government. Last week, it became clear that the Bank of England was deliberately withholding Venezuelan gold reserves. For some reason that's not entirely clear to me, a number of other countries deposit their gold reserves in the Bank of England. Maybe it's got better safekeeping. But Acting on American instructions, the British government has instructed the Bank of England not to hand over Venezuela's gold reserves, which it needs to pay for food imports. Now, if you think of that, if you're a bank and you refuse to hand over a customer's money, you're basically undermining your probity as a financial institution. And in general, it undermines the position of London as a financial, financial center for other states to do business. So even from the standpoint of the Conservative Party, which represents the interests of the city of London, this is a remarkably short-term, short-sighted policy to follow. Because what's going to happen is an increasing number of states will withdraw their money from London if they think that if Trump says he wants that money, he gets it. Now let's look at what the American government is demanding. It's demanding that the Speaker of the Assembly become the President. Now the Venezuelan Constitution has certain elements which are clearly modeled on the American precedent. They have a President, a Vice President, Speaker of the Assembly, Head of the Assembly. And that is the order of succession. 
if the president is incapacitated, dead or ill, then the vice president takes over. If the vice president is also incapacitated, dead or ill, then, and only then, can the Speaker of the Assembly take over as President. But he doesn't get to decide whether the President and Vice President are incapacitated. The Supreme Court, or Supreme Judicial Tribu Tribunal, has to decide that the President has gone mad or that he's too ill to serve, etc. And the Supreme Judicial Tri Tribunal has declared, no, the President is perfectly fit. He's not incapacitated in any way. So what Trump is demanding is that a man who never stood for election should be able to declare himself president of Venezuela. This is equivalent to, for example, um, let, let's say China, Mexico, Russia, India deciding Trump isn't president of America. Let's make Nancy Pelosi president of America as speaker of the Congress. She's in the same position of dissent, two steps away. It's clearly not, not nothing constitutional about it. It's a blatant attempt to put a puppet government in power. And the US has a long policy of not tolerating any independent nationalist or left-wing governments in Latin America, which are viewed as essentially its territory under the Monroe Doctrine, which dates from the early 19th century. Their methods of maintaining control have varied. In some cases, they have fermented military coups through their influence and training the officer corps of South American armies. <coughs> More recently, they have resorted to constitutional maneuver or semi-constitutional maneuver. In Uruguay and in Brazil, they have used semi-constitutional techniques to depose presidents who were antithetical to the United States. And in the latest Brazilian case, they impeached a president on trumped-up charges, <coughs> prohibited the most popular politician in the country, the head of the Workers' Party, from standing for the presidency, and a right-wing extremist managed to, to get elected. Now, what they are attempting to do in Venezuela is a straight repetition of what they did in um, in Brazil. But it is not so easy for them to do that as it was in Brazil because although the National Assembly is saying that, the other institutions of the state are remaining solid behind the constitutional order. The armed forces, the, the central the Supreme Court are all standing behind the legitimate president, unlike in Brazil. Now, why is that? Well, it's because there's a difference between the Venezuelan army and the army of most of the Latin American states, because from the start of the period of the Chavez government, there's been a direct conscious policy to recruit into the officer corps of the Venezuelan army people from the working classes rather than from the landed aristocracy and the professional classes. This gives an army leadership which has a different character, different political character from that in most South American states. And in addition, the Chavez government has followed the policy which I believe any socialist government should follow, which is backing up the armed forces with the equivalent of a home guard. They call it the National Guard. 
which has about two million people under arms, and they're predominantly drawn from the, the popular classes. This means that the attempt to carry out a coup of the type that the CIA used to orchestrate in Latin America is very difficult. If there are two and a half million people under arms who resist that coup, and if you have an officer corps that is basically unsympathetic to the United States, that attempt is going to be very difficult. Now, I'll come right back at the end to say that there are genuine economic difficulties in Venezuela. And these have to do both with what I would say are long-term mistakes of policy, have to do with the structural position of Venezuela as an oil state, which was heavily dependent on oil revenues. The United States, in conjunction with Saudi Arabia, has arranged to push down the price of oil in order to put pressure on Venezuela and Russia. And this has deprived the Venezuelan government of its major source of revenue. As a result, <coughs> because they don't have an efficient tax system, because they are not doing what Stafford Cripps did under the Ackley government, when he raised the tax rate on the wealthy in Britain to 97.5%. The wealthy are not taxed like that in Venezuela. And you have to tax them like that if you're going to follow the kind of social democratic policies they want to follow. Instead, they were trying to fund it out of oil revenue. When the oil price collapsed, they didn't have the money, and they've resorted to the printing press, which has caused hyperinflation, which has discredited the government at that point. But the government is not in a position to raise taxes at the moment because the National Assembly is in the hands of the opposition. It is a typical split power constitution of the sort the United States, France, Venezuela, Chile, these countries which have a presidency and a National Assembly. You can have one party in power in the National Assembly and another in the presidency. And you can get a deadlock. We can see the same deadlock happens in the United States, with the shutdown of government and the inability of the presidency and the Congress to agree taxes. This was a fatal weakness of the Allende government in Chile. They had the presidency, they didn't have the National Assembly. That prevented them carrying out the sorts of measures that the Attlee or Wilson governments were able to carry out in Britain. It's made out these countries are very radical socialists. That Allende and Chavez are really radical socialists. But in terms of the actual policies they're pursuing, they're not significantly more radical than the Labour Party has been at times. What's happening is they're doing it on America's doorstep. And America doesn't like that. And they're doing it in the country that doesn't have nuclear weapons the way Britain does. They are therefore much more subject to threat. But at the moment, the initial attempt at a coup has failed. The next step is the movement of US troops to the Colombian border. I don't know if you saw the clips on Facebook yesterday of US helicopters flying towards the border. Bolton has announced he's going to send covertly announced by holding up a sheet of paper, send 5,000 troops to the border within sight of the press cameras that they are sending troops there. Whether they can su succeed against the degree of opposition the Venezuelan army will put up, I don't know. But it's clearly a dangerous situation. OK, thank you, Paul. I was in shock there because he actually finished on time. So <laughs> 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 usually have to, uh, put arms up, backs and stuff. So we'll see if the same happens with the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> to now introduce uh, Tom Sheridan, who um, is going to speak for approximately 15 minutes, um, and then we'll have um, the floor open to questions.
<coughs> I'll stand up folks because I, I like standing because I get dead emotional uh, when I'm speaking about uh, subjects that um, mean a lot to me and, and this subject I've got to say right from the outset means a lot to me because solidarity is a political party, is a socialist political party in, in Scotland. We are for an independent socialist Scotland, we for a, an independent socialist republic, a democratic republic in Scotland and sometimes Sometimes in, in politics, it is necessary for you to look beyond your own shores. Although we fight very hard for an independent socialist Scotland, we always, always think global, but try and act local. So we're not cut off from what's happening in the rest of the world. We try and comment, we try and assist genuine progressive movements across the world. And that means sometimes, as a socialist party, you need to take sides. It's not you sitting in fences, or you end up with a sore ass. Sometimes you have to be willing to take a side. And as far as we are concerned, as far as solidarity is concerned, it is the easiest side to take now. Because on the one side, if you have any doubts whatsoever, on the one side, you've got Donald bloody Trump. Donald Trump is calling on the world to de-recognise a legitimately elected president. Donald Trump, who got three million votes less than his opponent in 2016, is asking the world to de-recognise Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. Well, I was going to say, has he got a brass neck? But you can't tell, because like me, I think he's fond of sunbeds. <laughs> Maybe over fond of the sunbeds. But Donald Trump is a right-wing, reactionary, sexist, racist, who now apparently has found concern for the poor, concern for human rights. What a lot of shit! That's what we should call it. Because this is nothing more, nothing less than a US inspired attempted coup d'etat. That's what this is all about. This is about getting rid of a government that is anti Trump, anti neoliberalism, calls for redistribution of wealth, public ownership. And what they've done since Chavez was elected way back in 1998 on a anti neoliberalism ticket, on a ticket that was about nationalising the oil and using it for the betterment of the people. What America has done since is tried to undermine the Venezuelan government. In 2002, there was another coup, and the points that Paul made are very, very marked tonight. Because what did they do in 2002? In 2002, they did use the army. They tried to overthrow Hugo Chavez. They had him arrested. And he was detained for 48 hours. And a new government was being announced. Unfortunately for the elites in Venezuela, and let's remember here, Venezuela has got more oil reserves than any other country on the planet, more than Saudi Arabia. Venezuela should be overflowing in wealth. And yet in 1998, 20% of the population were living in extreme poverty. 43% were living in poverty. And yet 20% living in extreme poverty in a country overflowing in oil. It's that anger that led to the support for Hugo Chavez to come in and change things, to do away with the corruption, to redistribute the wealth. And that's why he was elected. That's why he was sworn in in 1999 and immediately began to try and reverse the inequality in the Venezuelan economy and immediately faced barriers and sanctions from the United States and from other neoliberal economies. And yet, when they had a coup that had them arrested in 2002 and detained for two days, the barrios of Venezuela have been 
in Caracas. The barrios are like our big housing schemes, even more populated, very high in the hills around Caracas. Huge numbers live in these barrios and have been ignored for decades and decades, living in poverty, illiterate, low wages, if employed at all. The barrios turned out in the hundreds of thousands to call for Chavez to be released. There was a social revolution against the coup in 2002 and within two days Hugo Chavez was released under popular demand and significantly, significantly, the majority of the troops stayed loyal to Chavez. So the officer corps that organised that coup were ousted. What you've had since is a recognition Chavez was in the army. He was a commando, he was someone who rose up through the ranks from being an ordinary soldier to becoming a, a, a captain. He knew the importance of the army within Venezuelan society and that's exactly why they began to recruit from the working classes and from the barrios rather than just from the elites. That's why, up until now, and hopefully continuing, the Venezuelan troops and army have stayed loyal to the elected president. More than that, more than that, have they stayed loyal to Nicolas Maduro? They've stayed loyal to the constitution of Venezuela. A constitution that after Chavez was elected, they rewrote, they involved the people in the barrios across Venezuela in the rewriting of the constitution because they recognised that it was a constitution up until then that excluded the working classes, had no guarantees in terms of housing, in terms of income, in terms of education. They rewrote the constitution. By the way, Chavez didn't have to be put sell up for re-election after the new constitution was agreed. That was a democratic, mass democratic process that led to his re-election. You therefore have a history, a history in Venezuela of American intervention and American interference. We shouldn't be surprised here. I get angry when I hear so-called socialists either sitting on the fence or not prepared to back Maduro here. Have they not learned anything? Guatemala in 1954, Chile in 1973, Nicaragua in 1979, Iraq in 2003, Libya in 2011. When are we going to wake up here? America has got no interest in democracy or human rights. Their only interest is in running the affairs of these countries and extracting for themselves their natural resources. It is straightforward theft, colonialism, imperialism. That's what it is. Modern day imperialism. And as far as I'm concerned, solidarity and every other socialist and democrat should be willing to stand up now and say, regardless of mistakes, that may have been made in the management of the Venezuelan economy, regardless of the situation within the country in terms of them trying to cope with the socio-economic problems due to the collapse of the oil price, which has hurt their ability to spend and to pay for their social programs, regardless of all of that, the Venezuelans should be allowed to sort out Venezuela. Not America, not the European Union, not the United Kingdom. And you know, we've got here the disgraceful, disgraceful spectacle of a Spanish president, a Spanish president calling for the recognition of an unelected individual, Guido, in Venezuela, saying that it's undemocratic, the treatment of the people in Venezuela. Open your eyes to the treatment of the people in Catalonia before you start preaching to anybody else about the treatment of individuals within your own country. 
Hundreds of Catalan politicians still in prison, still not being charged, still not had a fair trial. And these people have got the cheek to recognise unelected individuals in Venezuela. Macron! Macron! How dare he tweet the other week about his recognition of the courage of the protesters in Venezuela? Well, you know what you do then, don't you? Get them to put on yellow vests and see if they're going to support them then. Support the protesters. Hypocrites. One and all. You've got a situation here, brothers and sisters. You have to understand this. There was an election in Venezuela last May. Over nine million people participated. Did you hear this on the table about, oh, it was illegitimate, it was rigged. Over 9 million people participated in that election. Nicolas Maduro faced two opponents. Nicolas Maduro won 6.2 million votes. He won 67% of the votes cast. And you've got Trump in court saying, ah, it was illegitimate. It was rigged. I've got a couple of these figures here. You've got Trump himself. He was elected on 46% of the votes cast. So, obviously, the figures were clear that 54% of the votes cast went to his opponent, because there was only two opponents in that election. He was elected in 46%. You know what that represented? The percentage of population. That represented 27.3% of the overall American population in failed to vote. Maduro's 67.8% of the votes that he got, I represented 31.7% of the overall population. The guy has got more legitimacy than Trump, but don't let's stop there. Let's look at Maurice Marci of Argentina. 51.2% of the vote representing 26% of his population. Let's look at Santos in Colombia, 53% of the vote representing 23% of the Colombian population. Let's look at Sebastian Pinera in Chile, 54% of the votes cast representing 26% of the Chilean population. In other words, brothers and sisters, these people in Argentina, in America, in Colombia, in Chile, that are calling the election in Venezuela illegitimate because they said the people boycotted it. I'd be telling you the whole story. Maduro was elected by a greater percentage of the Venezuelan population than any of them were elected by their own populations. That's the reality that you're not getting in the Western press. That's what you're not getting in the BBC and ITV and Channel 4 I watched last night. How disappointed was I to watch Jon Snow melt into insignificance in my eyes? I used to think he was quite decent <coughs> until I watched him last night join in that absolute cheerleading charade calling for Chris Williamson to give up his support for Maduro and to call for him to stand down. Why would you call for somebody that's just got 6.2 million votes last year to stand down? How dare they? They were giving out tomatoes. Did you see it? If you don't stand down within the next eight days, we're going to recognise Guido. Who the fuck is Guido? <laughs> You've got a guy who goes to a big demonstration mostly organised from the wealthy and the elites and stands up and says that I declare myself president come on are we really going to stand by and swallow the bullshit you're getting for the media that somehow or other that's the way things are done this is important for us this is important because you see my wee daughter was sort of a debate room my last night when I was getting angry watching Channel 4. She says, why do you care about this, Daddy? And I says, darling, the reason I care about this is because see if they can do it in Venezuela, they can do it anywhere. They can do it anywhere. I hope in the future 
that there will be an independent Scotland. I hope that independent Scotland decides to nationalise its oil and its land and its natural resources and use it for the people instead of for the millionaires. What's to stop America saying, well, where are we, Matt? They've got oil reserves. We are going to uh, recognise somebody else. <laughs> we, uh, we Davidson, we Ruth, you know, what she needs to do sitting on another tank and we'll recognise that. What's to stop that happening? Brothers and sisters, this is important to us. This may be thousands of miles away, but in terms of politics and morality and democracy, it's absolutely vital that we make a stand on this. You know, do you listen to that Egypt? Trump talking about, he's worried about human rights abuses. Human rights abuses. Mr. Hunt, human rights abuses. Let's make a wee bit of contrast and comparison. Let's look at Saudi Arabia. No democracy. War crimes in the Yemen. Sponsors Islamic terrorism all across the region. Executes political dissidents, including children, beheading women. Has massive oil reserves under control of the US. Then look at Venezuela, a democracy, has an elected president, doesn't he execute political dissidents, but it's got lots of oil reserves, <coughs> not under American control. That's the only difference. And that's what America wants to get, its hands on Venezuela's oil <coughs> reserves. We, here in Scotland, we, I think, have a duty to do all we can and everything we can to say to America loud and clear, keep your hands off Venezuela. Keep your armies, keep your generals, keep your elites out of that country. Stop trying to engineer a bloody and horrible coup. We know what happened in Guatemala in 54 when they overthrew the Arbenz government. We know what happened in 73 when they overthrew Allende's government and led to Pinochet coming to power on the graves of 20,000 people tortured and murdered and killed and led a military dictatorship for decades after. We know what's happened. In Iraq, when they told us, oh, you know, for those of you that are maybe still a wee bit influenced, oh, I was looking at that in the, the papers, Tommy, it's saying that he's a dictator and it's saying that, that he's, he, he's an authoritarian. Can you remember Coden Powell we, coming to meetings like this with big screens and telling us all about the weapons of mass destruction and where they were? A lot of crap, a lot of lies. Are we going to be conned again? Seriously, are we going to be conned again? by a Western media that's owned and controlled by the billionaires. We don't have a free press, come on. We've got a billionaire press that is there to puppet the narrative of the West. And that's what they're doing right now, to convince us that we should somehow be against Maduro. We saw what they've done in Libya, for Christ's sake. A perfectly functioning country. They didn't like Gaddafi, because he didn't like them. They told us, this is Clinton and, and, and others, Obama, told us, oh, we need to get rid of this government because this government's authoritarian. They overthrew it, and what have you got now? A basket case, an absolute basket case, a refugee crisis of their making. <coughs> Are we going to stand by and allow that to happen in Venezuela as well? Brothers and sisters, I say no. I say that we use whatever limited powers we have. We're coming to our meeting tonight in solidarity with the elected Venezuelan president to say to Nicolas Maduro, we're not really, we're not here to tell you how to run your government. What we are here to do is to recognise that you were elected to run your government. We would be upset if somebody told us that we shouldn't be supporting an elected individual Prime Minister or President in the future Scottish Republic. So from our point of view, we should, I, I say, we should have the duty to back Maduro, to back the Venezuelan people, to not have any quarter whatsoever 
with this idea of we've got a right to question what they're doing. Macron questioning, you know, how, how, how dare he question when he's brutalising the protesters in Paris with water cannon and truncheons, but he's applauding the courage of the protesters in Venezuela. Come on, a guy with less than 20% support now in his own country telling people that if you recognise an unelected guy in Venezuela. Brothers and sisters, I conclude my remarks by saying loud and clear and hopefully we will get this on video and we will get it out on social media and hopefully you'll use your social media accounts as well to declare 100% that we are with Maduro, we are with the Venezuelan people, we are for democracy and we are against American imperialism. Thanks very much. Uh, we're now going to take uh, any contributions or questions uh, from the floor. I don't know everybody, so I'll just indicate to you um, to come in, but if, I think if you've been on for too long, I will cut you out. So, gentlemen. John Tolles, I do a wee bit of social media, allegedly. Um, I've been triangulating social media on a full Luke's Twitter account now for about two weeks. The majority of people putting messages out are actually in agreement with the Venezuelans. I can tell you that for a fact. However, there's something that's just happened that I sent to Tommy the other night there. Uh, and I'm sure you know the name, Ellie Abrams. And this is a chap that Trump has put in to restore democracy. This guy was convicted over the Iran Contra affair, and he's also responsible, although he denies it, of course, for 22,000 deaths. This is a guy that's been put in charge of restoring democracy in Venezuela. The reason for mentioning this to you is this guy's name isn't in the popular press. It's not getting told about anything anywhere. You'll not hear it on the TV at all. You've got to rely upon Seymour Hesh, John Pilger and others to feed this stuff through. For me, I'm relying upon a friend in America to feed this to me. And I think ultimately it's a wee bit like, I don't know, it's a bit like putting you know, Boris Johnson in charge or something. You know it's going to be a complete disaster. This guy's not just a disaster, this guy's got a determination that I would say is aligned with similar things that have happened to Gaddafi. You know, Gaddafi tried to create the United States of Africa. In, in, in trying to compete with the American dollar and get people to buy into the American states so that they had a rich country. And he's now dead. And I kind of look at these other people that are trying to do something with their country. And as long as they've got oil, they'll be dead. And that's the way I look at it. And I thought I'd put that name to you. You might want to research this guy, get his name out there, because there's an awful lot of hidden information flying about. But just to finish off, the majority, 68% of people tweeting worldwide. America is at it. That's, that's a really positive um, message to hear. Anyone else want to? Yes. So we're looking at this situation with Trump on one side and the socialists and Democrats on the other. Now, this isn't the first mistake Trump has made in his presidency about recognition. And only months in office, he recognised Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine. He's recognising an unelected president. Next he'll be recognising that Northern Ireland, eh, sorry, the Republic of Ireland is part of the UK. Trump is one of the biggest fools that we have in modern day politics. He's only there because he's a money man. Now, Venezuela, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have a stone of destiny. You can't just sit down and declare yourself president of the country. <coughs> it's loud and clear that the message is out there. Maduro is the elected president and figurehead. We know the games America play and they know what they were after. People have learned the mistakes of the Iraq war and realised that it is just imperialism and plunder that the US control. It won't be long before we see the United Kingdom sending troops across because we seem to be America's puppet. So I think it's time that we take a stand and we say loud and clear that it is hands off Venezuela and it's no support from Scotland and hopefully we'll see the socialists in the rest of the United Kingdom coming out in support and saying this time we are not sending troops. Just as a um, sort of footnote on what you said earlier, Tom, you know, who is Guido? Um, there was a, a poll done in a Venezuelan magazine 
that revealed that until he announced that he should be the president, 82% of the Venezuelans had never heard of the guy. And this is the guy that's meant to be A, third in line for the presidency, and also thinks he's more legitimate than the elected president. And yet only 18% of the population have ever actually heard his name before. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I've just got a question about Mobile. So, I think it's fairly self-evident what Trump's motive is, what the Canadian, Canadian Prime Minister and then some of the main players in South America have joined the smear campaign against Maduro, but if you look at some of the European players, if you look at Jeremy Hunt, Kosti Holm, Macron, Donald Tusk, do you have a theory or an idea of what their motive might be? Because for me, anyway, it's difficult to imagine a, a scenario that they're going to directly benefit from American imperialist movement against Venezuela. Paul, Paul can give you his top ones. Sorry, what's your first name? Mark. Mark. Paul, Paul will give you his top ones worth as well. Uh, my my, my top ones worth is quite simply that the European nations do not wish to cross swords with America. Uh, America, I read, I read a quite detailed article just today about the process that took place in Spain and the uh, US Embassy in Madrid and how they were on the phone on the 22nd of January to the um, Prime Minister um, in, 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 in Madrid and they pulled in the uh, uh, representatives of the uh, Madrid government and they made it absolutely clear that there was going to be an announcement the next day and they would be looking for a quick response of support. Uh, it was in their interest because it's in America's interest. So the Madrid government, you know, the guy who's done the story um, says, you know, it was with reluctance and all that stuff, right? But they still came out within hours to say, yeah, we recognise Guido. And you think about this, this guy stands up the 23rd of January and within hours, America's recognised him as a new president. And people still say to you, uh, when you, when you suggest that America's engineered this, they say, oh, what proof do you have of that? <laughs> who who recognises a, a politician that he's heard of if they hadn't put them in place in the first place. And, and from my point of view, what I believe is taking place across the European Union is the European Union countries that are frightened to cross swords with America, don't want to fall out with America, are prepared to put their hands up and say, yes, okay, we, we support them as well. Particularly the United Kingdom, as I think Sam said there, you know, usually America says to Britain, jump in, and Britain says how high. Uh, and that, that relationship is, is continuing as far as I'm concerned here. I've got to say I'm very, very disappointed. Maybe, you know, shouldn't be surprised. But I'm very, very disappointed with the process in Greece right now. Because Greece is supposed to have a sort of a left government. They were shafted by the European Union, were impoverished by, by the European Union. Um, and initially they were saying, oh no, we're not going to recognise them. But the mood of music that's coming out now is they're eventually now going to come out and and recognise this guy, such as the pressure they're getting put under. It, it actually beggars a wee bit of belief that the one country in Europe, the reason the European Union hasn't been able to come out with a unified statement is because the right-wing government in Italy has refused to back this uh, unelected individual. Uh, their, their point, I think, is probably uh, that they've got in mind for themselves, and that is if you start recognising unelected people, maybe it'll happen to them as well. Um, so, from my point of view, it's all about U.S. imperialism and the power of U.S. imperialism. Mark. I think there's that. There's the fact that the majority of the European countries are in NATO, but it's not even just countries in NATO. Because Sweden, which is not in NATO, and has gone along with the U.S. here. I think it's down to class interest. These are capitalist countries. They see even a mildly socialist government like Maduro's, nationalizing the oil industry and not favoring multinational companies. And that's basically prejudices them against it and puts them in a position <coughs> where they already saw Maduro as the enemy and it didn't take much to push them over the other way. They would not have been willing to do it in the other direction. They would not have been willing to support a leader of the assembly in a South American country that was of the left when the president was of the right. So, <coughs> I, I think the, the publicity, I mean, you mentioned Tommy, certainly, Mr. talking about it, 
for the publicity about by the Western media has been absolutely outrageous. I mean, it's uh, seen me discuss a bit more than, than even Brexit has. Uh, uh, really building up anti-Maduro uh, propaganda. Uh, and I, and I, I mean, it's, uh, I go along with, with Paul, you know, I think it's in every country, it seems to me, every country that favours the free market as opposed to Maduro. And they're in favour of Trump. It doesn't matter uh, whether the man is a complete, uh, whether Trump is a complete fool. Uh, or, or not, it's the fact is he represents the, the free market. Uh, and I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm very, I get very annoyed when I see the, the television because as I said, it keeps, it's just incessant, it's, it's pure propaganda, they're not even trying to be subtle about it anymore. And I saw, what's his name, Keir Starmer, the, is it Sir Keir Starmer, the, oh. uh, saying, saying what, uh, what, uh, how undemocratic Maduro was, it was going on a bit. I and had um, um, uh, sharpshooters firing on the crowd, you know, which has been proved to be an absolute lie. It was it was a right wing that was that was had organised uh, uh, the fireworks uh, for the uh, against the uh, people's demonstration the one day. But uh, you know, I mean, people like that, and even the SNP, which has seemed to be left to centre as, as supporting Guido, you know, it's, it's absolutely disgraceful. But. And the two questions I'd like to ask, one for Paul was, was what was the, the Venezuelan media situation? What are they, what are they saying? Are they, you know, and, and, and what have they been saying? And for, for Tommy, you know, saying, you know, what, what would happen with Scotland? Well, what happens if they get away with it in Venezuela? Do you know things that Cuba will be next? Thank you. Paul, can you speak to the, the media in Venezuela, the majority of it is controlled by the right wing and is therefore pro the usurper. There is some channels which are controlled by the government, so it's highly split. You can't say the media in general. It's interesting, Jock. Um, when I was there in 2003, um, it was in October of 2003, and there was a, a movement at the time. Uh, it was the recall movement. Uh, as part of the new constitution, it was a wonderful part of the constitution that if 15% um, of the population called for the recalling of the president, then the president had to face re-election, which I think is wonderful because you should have a right of recall. Right? Interestingly, it was Chavez that proposed that in the new constitution and then became a victim of it because what happened was the elites and the right wing organised to have him recalled because they said he was overstepping the mark and he was doing too much nationalisations and things like that. And while I was there, um, the people who were interpreting for us, Venezuelans who uh, were, were in uh, Glasgow and had arranged the trip, they were um, very, very concerned to show me the newspapers and interpret them, but then for me to watch the TVs. And it was incredible. I mean, it was incredible how biased it was all. Recall, recall, recall. The Chavez must be recalled. Blah, blah. And you think, when I'm going to that country and I'm hearing all these stories, I'm thinking, oh, it's supposed to be authoritarian. It's all supposed to be Chavez. And all. It was totally anti-Chavez. And it was the ruling elites controlled the media, controlled the TV, and it was completely and utterly. He, he ended up um, <coughs> having a weekly bulletin every, every week he would because it was the only way he could get his position across where he actually um, went directly to the people because the, none of the TV stations would give him any, any time and the newspapers were all against him. And actually, when I left the country, um, not long after I left, it was announced that they reached the 15% mark. So they actually had a recall election in 2004 and they won it by 56% of the vote. So even though he was recalled, he then won the election. Jimmy Carter, who was there on behalf of the Jimmy Carter Foundation as an election observer, complimented the election as an example to the world about how to conduct elections. Right, so that's, that's how fair and democratic it was. Interestingly, there's been a whole um, army of election observers who have said that last year's election was fair and democratic, but you don't hear of them. All you hear is the ones who say, no, it was rigged, it was undemocratic. 
I'm not going to these voices who say that it was fair and open. People say, oh, the people boycotted it. I've just gave you the figures. I've just gave you the figures. That his uh, percentage represented 31.7% of the vote. But more importantly, 46% of the population voted. 46. So, great boycott. 46% uh, voted. The American election, 52% voted. So, you, you know, 7% of a difference in terms of participation in an election. But nobody says, oh, the people have boycotted the election in America. So, it, it really is totally, utterly one-sided, uh, job. I had the pleasure when I was there, I tried to interview uh, Chavez. Unfortunately, at that time, the level of security surrounding him was massive because the, the, the coup uh, in, in 2002 was still very alive and there had been all sorts of warnings and threats that there was going to be another attempted coup. I got invited to a, a meeting that was called in like two hours notice, it was a, like an underground meeting and it was the Chavistas um, and I heard them speak, it was, it was incredible, there was over a thousand people turned out in two hours notice, it was, it was fantastic and my interpreter interpreted and sorry, translated and he was an extremely charismatic character, he, he carried the crowd, he, he, he had that air of when he was in the room, there was something about him. I got the pleasure of shaking his hand as he left, which was, which was, which was marvellous. And then I got to interview the Vice President, uh, Jose Vicente Rangel, who, um, when I said to him, I said, I'm here from Scotland, I'm a socialist, and I'm here to find out, is the Venezuelan revolution a nationalist revolution? Because they call it the Bolivarian revolution. Or is it a socialist revolution? What's your opinion? What do you think of this government? Um, and Jose Vicente Rangel said, I'm very, very pleased with this government. It's the first one in my lifetime that has not put me in prison, <laughs> which, which I thought was brilliant. He, he formed the Young Communist League in Venezuela at the age of 16, so he'd been active in politics all his life. And he told me that there are new winds blowing across Latin America. People are fed up with the yoke of imperialism. The reason we appeal to Bolivar is because he overthrew the yoke of imperialism in the 1900s and now we're turning to Chavez and, 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 and Morales and, and Castro. They're overthrowing the, the yoke of imperialism in the 20th and 21st century. So that whole process showed me, I then went and spent some days in the barrios and we visited some of the, the missions, they call them missions. Um, we would call them social programs, they called them missions. They've halved extreme poverty, half general poverty, built two and a half million new houses for people to move into. They've got this massive music program uh, with about 700,000 kids enrolled in orchestras across uh, Venezuela learning musical instruments as a form of career um, and, and also for artistic development. Fantastic and great ideas. Now, problem is, since 2014, collapse of the oil price, then problems have set into the economy. Absolutely, nobody's, nobody's trying to deny that. But you don't react to problems in the economy. They're kicking out the elected president. It's just, it's just no done. You have asked, is Cuba next? There's no doubt in my mind that if Cuba had oil, they would have already been overthrown. The, 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 the fact that Cuba survived um, 60 years of horrible economic sanctions and blockades is a miracle, a complete and utter Miracle, been a pleasure to, vi to visit and interview the um, uh, officials within the government and speak to people in the streets in, in Cuba. Six times I've been there and the, the people are beautiful, the, the, the commitment to their society is beautiful. They've got very little, but they can all read and write. They've got health for everybody, they've got housing for everybody. It's very basic, but everybody's housed. And it's from that point of view that what America has to in my opinion, try and nip them in the bud is the idea that there's a different form of economic formation than neoliberalism. Anything that's anti-neoliberal, we need to smash it because we don't want people in America thinking that there's an alternative to free market capital. So yes, I think uh, Cuba uh, will be next. Yes, Bolivia will be in, in their eyesights. You've got to remember, you've got Nicaragua supporting Maduro, you've got Iran supporting Maduro, you've got Russia supporting Maduro, you've got China supporting Maduro, Turkey supporting Maduro, you've got El Salvador supporting you've also got Maduro, Mexico, which is you've got Mexico supporting Maduro. So, this, by the way, some of you might be saying, oh, I didn't know that. 
Because you wouldn't know that if you were to watch it, the, the news. Because all you get is who's not supporting Maduro. But they don't give you who is supporting Maduro. In some of the other countries, like Norway, for instance, and, and, and some other European countries, they're not supporting, they're not recognising the, uh, uh, the Gudu. What they're saying is that there, there should be uh, parlevu, there should be talking, there should be negotiations. And Maduro himself has said, yeah, no problem, let's have that. It's America that's refusing to, to accept that. So yes, I think next in the sights, if they get away with this, will be Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia, Evo Morales' government will be targeted. <laughs> um, Nicaragua will be, be targeted. El Salvador, just the other day, you know, uh, in amongst all of the horrible right-wing news, particularly in Brazil, wasn't it good that uh, a 37-year-old who wasn't from any of the two main parties, it's not a socialist, but he's a radical. He's, he's, he's saying that everybody in El Salvador should have a decent standard of living if there was no more theft. That's good enough for me. That makes me think that he's in the right track. He was elected in El Salvador on Sunday. Um, so it's not all rightward drifts. There are some wee pebbles there of hope that we have got to keep uh, portraying and promoting. Okay, anybody else want to? Yeah? Yeah, I think for a start, the sheer goal in countries such as France, United Kingdom, America, and Spain, have been the cheek to criticise Venezuela for the society being slightly, slightly you know, fractured. It's a cheap, they're four of the, the most fractured nations on earth at the moment. It's, it's bamboozling to think how people can take this seriously. I'm also really, really, you know, <coughs> um, disappointed with the relative silence of the major left the centre parties in Britain. There have been, such as Chris Williams, and um, there have been exceptions. But they've really been, they've not really stood up and come out and support um, and do, you know, an elected president of a country. And it's disappointing. I would expect it more from parties in Scotland, to be honest. Uh, so I can only say it's vital for individuals like ourselves and smaller socialist movements such as Solidarity and many more across the uh, United Kingdom that we get the message out over um, social media and um, in any way, any means possible. Because obviously the elected people don't seem to be doing a very good job of it, so it's left the normal individuals like ourselves. I think so. you should you should be careful in saying that about the Labour Party at the moment. Yes. The leader of the Labour Party has come out strongly against American intervention. And Barry Gardner on TV <coughs> yeah, I see that. Yeah. was also yeah. strongly against yeah. it. But the, the uh, media will, of course, give more prominence to the right wingers course, yeah. who want yeah. to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, can I also say, um, I think someone else mentioned the SNP. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm speaking out of turn here. Uh, I have noticed there have been uh, at least one, if not more, SNP MPs who, in my opinion, have disgracefully um, called for the recognition of an unelected uh, president in a country a thousand miles away. But as far as I'm aware, the SNP as a party has not done that. No, it was more actually the people, the, the lack of support for, for Maduro. Maduro than, 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 well, I, I, I've got to say, uh, you know, you would expect a small country like Scotland's political representatives to say, even if they said, we are not, uh, sometimes you recognise people by the friends they keep. And given that Donald Trump's calling for this, that's good enough reason for us not to be supporting it. We are not uh, taking a side or whatever, but to this one tweet I read about somebody guy attacking uh, Maduro, I thought, wait a minute, and then somebody come in and say, this is a disgrace, this is SNP, and I said, no, no, this is one, one MP, it's not the whole of it. In fact, I think, I think if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a petition being raised in, being raised in Westminster that Pete Wishart and others have been involved in for the SNP uh, against the, the, the Trump <laughs> recognition. So. Uh, hopefully the SNP as a party won't go down the, the lines of oh well we better do it because America's said it, you know. I've been surprised that. I, yeah, I, I've got to say, uh, well I'd be disappointed to put it that way. Okay, yeah. Sure, the, sure the silence is definitely for the SNP. It's later on actually basically supporting Maduro, Maduro. Then SNP is going to lose ground here. Uh, we don't have a control for the sales. That's been proposed <coughs> that Tommy should propose himself as the president of Scotland. 
<laughs> this boys, the SNP lack of support for India Red 2. Now, it's, it's, it's no, obviously a serious thing. It's ready to ridicule the position of the SNP if you are not come out and support them. I, I don't, I'm not here as a spokesman for the SNP, far from it. Um, but I know that when it comes to international affairs, their, their argument will be that it's not their remit to, um, to, to, uh, to make those points. However, if any of them are asked, and, and maybe that they have been asked, and because they've not towed the line, you've not read about it, uh, but if any of them are asked, I would be extremely disappointed if they did anything other than to recognise Maduro. Uh, but personally... I mean, that doesn't really wash these people in positions of responsibility in Scotland. They're looking for a constituency to go for independence. And they don't speak up about something as important as that. Listen, you're not going to get an argument from me. committed to the idea. 64% of the population, apparently, mm -hmm. or on social media, are supporting the group. And the SNP haven't got the gumption to come out and support them. Well, so solidarity certainly. I mean, we've got a press officer at the back here. And in terms of a, um, a, a united call, I would say, for your solidarity, I mean, it would, it would be solidarity calls in the SNP. <laughs> to back the elected president of Maduro. You, should, you know, Kenny will put that out. Uh, I mean, that's, that's your position. John, please. I'm just going to say that this is an hour old. Uh, I've passed it to Kenny. 170 countries now recognise Maduro. Is that right? 23 recognise Guido. <laughs> there's also a map, and if you go to the Hope Over Fear social media, you can retweet that, because it's, it's literally from it's traceable sources, it's accurate. Just on the SNP, apart from not being able to speak in foreign affairs, I know pretty much all of them, and I know all of them, I'm a former president comes for them. They are all in support of the democratic side of Venezuela. But the problem is, you can't get a TV station to talk on it, you can't get a radio station to talk on it. You could put it into social media, but the reality of it is that social media for many people, unless it's highlighted in the press, and I can tell you this for an absolute fact, you're hitting about 12% of the Scottish population on social media, that's all you're hitting. So if somebody says to me they're putting something out, the whole population gets to see it, they don't. No, they could put it out the national. They could, the national could put it out. I take the view that they should put it out. Should they should put it out on social media with it being picked up by. They should, they should, but the so party have not made a statement on it yet. I, I think that, that that's a, a position for the SNP. It just comes amongst their ranks. Um, we as a party have, have taken a very clear stance in terms of what our position is they need to and, and I think we can use social media to shame politicians into taking a stance or taking a position what, how they progress that um, is up to their um, internal um, ranks to, to Can I just that? pick up what you said there John, I don't think everybody heard that um, you, from verifiable sources yep. you're saying that 170 countries in the world are in recognition of Maduro yep. as a legitimate president compared to 93 countries that have went with the US line of <coughs> recognising Guido. 23! <laughs> so, what I'm suggesting is it's on our social media, Kenny's got it. I've already put it on there. Get it out there. Okay. Okay. So, I hope we ought to take a bit of encouragement for that, so that's why I asked to get it uh, clarified because that does sound remarkable and it's definitely verifiable, John. I know there's a lot of push gets put out in social yep. media, so but it's verifiable stuff. Yes, it's new on the saw that I great Okay. Uh, is there anybody that hasn't yet spoken that wants to come in and ask a question or make a point before I bring in others who have already spoken and want to come in again? Okay. So we're, we're talking about the SNP and the SNP's sort of stance on the Maduro situation. We've got to look a wee bit bigger than that. Mm -hmm. There's more than one party in power in Scotland. You've got the Greens in Hollywood, you've got Labour, you've got the Tories, you've got the Lib Dems. I think it would be important for it to call on the Scottish Government to recognise Maduro. There's so many times, unfortunately, that Hollywood <laughs> lets it down by not taking a position on these situations. We're bigger than just the UK. We don't need 
our voices to come from Westminster and that to be the be all and end all. I think it's important that we all tonight apply pressure to our MSPs, our councillors, our MPs to recognise Maduro and then maybe we'll have a collective Scottish voice coming out in support of the legitimate President of Venezuela. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions or points? Yes, Councillor. I'm not as uh, well known as the solidarity group for uh, for party, so it's been like a whole topic. But just coming from what you say, in the whole sense of that the media are stonewalling in such a biased side, and it's all coming from the West point of view. Are you not worried, in a sense, as a party? That what you're saying is going to be totally written off in a sense of, well, this is against what the news is saying, and there's such, let's be honest, from Brexit and whatnot, there's such a big percentage of our population that goes off what they hear in the news, and I was wondering what your, in a sense, tactic is to overcome that obstacle, in a sense, in which people are going to hear an opposing view on mainstream media when they sit down at 6 o'clock with a cup of tea. Like, how are you looking to overcome that? That's a really good point. We're going to wind up these things. Yeah, we're going to wind up just about five minutes a um, chance to kind of gather our thoughts on, on all the questions that have been asked tonight. Is there any final points that anybody would like to, to raise? Yes, John. Apart from oil, why are they invading us? Yeah. I, think, I think you've answered your own question there. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Okay. Tell me we'll end up. Oh, you know, no, it's okay. Sorry, what am I calling you? Uh, James. James, that was a very good question, James. And, you know, I've learned some things tonight as well. I hope everybody that came along um, has enjoyed the meeting. I hope you've picked up some information which you can use. Uh, some of the stuff I've been using here, uh, you can come up and, and take pictures of it or whatever um, and use it in your own uh, social uh, media uh, websites. That comparison of the turnout in the elections is all here, the stuff about Saudi Arabia is here. Um, and a lot of the other stuff um, you can get via Telesa, which is an alternative uh, in Spanish um, uh, website that, that um, um, gives you a lot of the Latin American politics and get, gives you an alternative point of view that you don't get um, is it from, from, from the, the Western, and you've also got Venezuela sorry, analysis. Tell us, sorry, is it oh, sorry, 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 yes. But you've also got Venezuela analysis. Uh, as another one, you've got hands off Venezuela, you've got solidarity with Venezuela, <coughs> and they're, they're fantastic websites. Please go onto them and, and look into them uh, yourselves. But what's been encouraging for me is some of the points that, that, that John's been made there. John um, was for many um, years um, involved at the, at the heart of, of the SNP and, and uh, a lot of the social media strategy. So he's a, he's a wizard as far as the social media is concerned. So when he comes out with figures about the 68% of the tweets that are going on across Twitter being uh, in favour of Maduro and against America, that's encouraging for me. It, it, that, that takes up the point that you're making because I think um, it's all right for me as a, as a coming up for 55 and having been involved, for instance, in the, the minor strike of 1984-85 when I got my first real taste of what the media was about and how they manipulated stories and how they turned people against the strikers and tried to give you a uniform narrative which was the miners were bad, the government was good and everybody should hate the miners. And it never worked universally. But it did work in some communities. But it made me think a way back then, I'm never going to trust the media again. So I learned that. Some people didn't learn that. Some people have to go through personal experience before they learn these things. And I would argue, for those of you in Scotland who were involved in the 2014 <coughs> referendum, I would argue that was a learning curve about the biased media, one-sided narrative. The way the BBC was used, not as an independent news output, but was used as an arm of the British establishment to promote fear story after fear story, to give prominence to the most obscure stories. I remember one of them, with the Deutsche Bank that uh, they, they came out. If people voted for independence, we were going to deliver across Europe the biggest depression since the 1930s. 
Now remember, it was the first story on 24 hour news. It never lasted, of course, because it was a pile of crap. But it had the desired effect of raising up the fear level. Oh, could we put no deal? That's going to cause a depression. Pensions are going to fail. Oh, no, we can't. Banks are going to close. Oh, b and is going to move away. A lot of rubbish that the media fed the frenzy and tried to frighten people. So there's no doubt, in my opinion, media is still powerful. But let me make this point. George Monbiot made the point uh, just in the run-up to, to the to referendum itself when he said, if the people of Scotland do vote for independence, it will have been a remarkable victory for social media over corporate media. Now, as it happened, we started at 25% in 2013. We got to 45% in 2014, <coughs> despite the Klondike of, of media bias. I think that was a victory. I think it was a, a moral victory, and I think we lost that battle, but we're going to win that war. Uh, independence, in my opinion, is inevitable in Scotland. We're, we're going to get there. However, what it does show me, when you look at 71%, according to all the sophology, 71% of young people backed independence, despite the corporate media. That encourages me that most young people now, and you know, some of you are looking around here and you are young people. How many of you buy newspapers? I used to do some lecture up at Strathclyde a few years ago, uh, sociology, and I remember asking a class of about 36, uh, I says, you know, what newspapers do you buy? <laughs> and they, they hands went up. I said, do you buy any? No. Well, what newspapers do you read? And the only one that they admitted to was the Metro because they got it free on the subway or on the train or, or on the bus. Some then said, well, I sometimes look at the sports pages, then the only ones that were into football and all that. That is a lesson, isn't it? The newspapers have nowhere near the influence that they used to have. And I would argue, I would argue that even the mainstream media, the six o'clock news, I mean, I, 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 you know, my, my wife was going mental with me the other day because I was absolutely spitting blood uh, when I was watching uh, the politics show on uh, Thursday night, you know, that Andrew Neil show, right? One man, I'm fucking biased bastard, you know. He's, he's one sided, total and utter bias. And she's like, What are you talking about? Who's watching it? And, and, and the truth is, who is watching it? You know, apart from anoraks like me, who's watching that, right? And, and I, I do think that we can sometimes be stuck in the scenario where we think that the media is all powerful. It is still powerful, don't undermine it but it's not as powerful as it once was and I do think social media is beginning to compete with it which is why which is why and there's no uh, doubt this is happening there is beginning to be manipulation in the social media uh, front some of you I'm sure have had this already I have been on um, Twitter Kenny Rossi I've set up my account was it 2014 or 13 something like that so say, say for five or six years I've never in six years of being on Twitter, had my account closed. Never. Yesterday, I had my account closed 26 times and had to re-put in my details, right? Somebody somewhere manipulated. Now, was it any surprise that what I was putting out all, all that time, I was just sitting putting out pro-Maduro, pro-Venezuela, anti-imperialist stuff, 26 times I had to stop because it says I was locked out, locked out, locked out, locked out, and I had to put in my code again. So, if that's happening to me, somebody for Glasgow, you can imagine what's happening to people uh, across uh, Venezuela and, 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 and those countries that are supporting uh, Maduro, it will be happening there as well. So let's not think that social media is beyond manipulation, but let's use it where we can. Let's use it where we can. That's the answer I would give to you, that we've got to try the only way weapons we've got. We're not going to get on to question time. I part of the question times in Mullerwell on Thursday night, and, and there's loads of people kept saying, Tom, have you been invited to run a question time? I'd bust out laughing, you know. What, why would they invite somebody that's going to go in there and, 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 and talk the truth and, and give it loudly? Uh, I, I'm not going to mince words on a programme like that. They don't want people like that on these programmes. I don't know if you've noticed that the, the, the people that are inviting on them. I mean, for Christ, last week there was five right winners on, on, the, on the panel. It was unbelievable. Joey uh, Barton. Was that? Joey Barton. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Exactly. I mean, Farage was invited 12 times. 12! 12, 12 
times for us, 12 times. It's, it's the anchor programme of the BBC and they give that twa, 12 bloody invites on there. You know, incredible. So from my, my point of view, we have to try uh, and use the social media as best we can. Um, my, my, my finishing remarks uh, is this, folks. Um, please, um, if you've learned nothing from, from tonight's uh, meeting, then um, I, we apologise because it was here tonight to try and educate, to try and raise a counter narrative to what you're getting in the mainstream media. If what you've heard is something that has struck a chord with you, then please go and retweet it or put it on Facebook and, and get your friends and family involved. If you want to get involved politically, Solidarity is an open political party. We welcome new members. If you're a socialist at heart or you think you're a socialist, go and check our website, solidarity.scot. Check what's uh, there, see if you like it, and if you do, sign up and join our party. It's a small party. We're, we're, not, we're not going to win government in the next election. But you know what? Every, every small movement uh, can become a big movement if enough people get involved. So I, I would I, I appeal to you to do that. And then the final uh, point I would make, I think we've got the same venue, Lisa. Have we got it booked yet? 30th of, yes. Booked. On the 30th of March, which isn't that too far away, we've got the same venue here. We're hoping to maybe have some musical accompaniment as well. Um, we have got a celebration of the poll tax struggle. Uh, obviously, uh, we're now in 2019, and, and we, we perhaps some of you remember 1989 is when they introduced uh, the poll tax in Scotland first, a year before England and Wales. Uh, and I would argue that that was a movement that didn't get much media coverage. But by Christ, we beat them. <laughs> we organised in the communities, we went over the heads of the media, and we organised mass civil disobedience, and we beat the poll tax, and we beat Thatcher as well, and we put her up into the political knackers yard where she belonged. Uh, the Iron Lady was melted down during that particular campaign. So we're going to have a, a meeting in here Saturday afternoon, 30th of March, some speakers, some music, and I would invite you all to put that in your diaries and try and make it Saturday 30th of March. Thanks very much for coming.